Hello and welcome to the Scottish International Storytelling Festival. And this is a session from the Shetland Islands. And we're going to play you some tunes from Shetland and give you the stories behind the tunes as well. I'm Morris Henderson, fiddle player, and I've got Ewan Thompson here, uh, another fellow Shetlander. And he's also a fiddle player, but tonight he's going to be playing the guitar. The guitar. And uh, Ewan, Ewan's from Fair Isle originally and now lives in the Shetland mainland where he's a, a fiddle maker as well as a fiddle player and uh, I've been playing the fiddle for years around here and telling yarns and uh, delighted to be asked to be part of this festival so I'll give you a bit of background to the the fiddle is the the main traditional instrument in Shetland uh, there's just, you know, loads of people play the fiddle up here very popular and we've got a, a great uh, repertoire of traditional tunes. And we're going to start with some from the days of the Greenland whaling. And we call them the Greenland tunes. And uh, this goes back to the, the times when uh, the, the whaling fleet would sail up the coast of Britain. And they would be coming from the ports of Hull and Whitby. And from Scotland, from Dundee and Aberdeen, Peterhead. Yeah. And... Uh, they would sail up the coast and then arrive in Lerwick in, in Shetland and they would be looking to top up the crews with the uh, Shetlanders because they were renowned and extremely skilled uh, sailors and this, uh, particularly for handling small boats and this was ideal for when they got up to the Arctic and uh, hunting the whales. So Lerwick in those days it was uh, well known as being a pretty wild and lawless place, particularly in the, what they called the Greenland time. And that was uh, usually about April when the ships arrived in port and the uh, Shetland men from all over the islands would be heading down to, to Lerwick to join ships and they would be keen to get on maybe a particularly good whaling ship or with a, a captain with a reputation of... Uh, being a, a good a good whale hunting ship and also the conditions of the boats as well they they would want to get on a, a ship that uh, maybe didn't leak too much and they would spend the whole trip pumping water out and that type of thing but uh, when they arrived in Lerwick it was a, a wild place and it was the last stop before the north ice and uh, there would be wild rants that took place in in the Town of Lerwick, you can still see them all the narrow lanes that lead up from the main street, which follows the shoreline. And uh, in the houses and the lanes, there'd be all night parties and sessions, and the fiddle would be very much part of it. And the tunes are for dancing, and in particular the Shetland Reel. So we'll play a couple of yeah. tunes, the Greenland tunes. And the first one is called Oliver Chack, and then we're going into one called The Merry Boys of Greenland. Thank you. 
that's uh, a couple of very popular tunes in Shetland. And uh, if you're learning the fiddle, that's a couple of the, the first tunes you would probably pick up. And uh, I remember, in fact, I think it was the first tune I learnt on the fiddle at Merry Boys of Greenland, and it's still a, a great tune to play. A lot of energy with it. But those whaling days, uh, a life aboard ship, you were setting sail from Shetland and maybe doing a, a trip, an early trip, they might go up to Svalbard or Spitsbergen and hunting seals and then and, and whales if they, if they saw whales. But then the west of Greenland was also a very popular place they would head there. And it was quite a long voyage even from Shetland, especially if the, the wind conditions weren't uh, just ideal and they were maybe going into the wind, it could take several weeks. And uh, aboard ship, the fiddle was always popular for entertainment, keeping the morale up. And uh, quite often a fiddler would be sought after as a member of the crew. Yeah. So fiddler, fiddlers travelled and the fiddles travelled up to Greenland. And uh, the aboard ship, though, it could be tough. It could be tough times, uh, the conditions aboard. The Shetlanders sometimes, they, they as well as being a... Uh, skilled at sailors, they also were cheap labour, so they didn't get the same quarters as some of the others and uh, same conditions uh, and quite often there could be bullying aboard uh, ganging up and uh, it bred uh, strong characters and there's one in particular I can think of there's a strong Johnny Hunter, he was a famous uh, Fettler whaler from the island of Fettler whaling man and uh, he was a powerful fellow. He used to, they say, when him and his brother, they used to practice sparring as uh, boys. And uh, they were both incredibly strong and, and good fighters. So he was a bit of a fighting man as well. And the board ship, he didn't want that. He didn't tolerate bullying. And especially when it came to the, the Shetland men, he looked out for them. Sometimes they were just youngsters, you know, coming aboard. And then when... One ship, well, as a as a young fellow, he actually uh, knocked out the champion of Hull, who was a, a bully aboard, and he, he didn't tolerate him. And uh, after that, then Strong Johnny Hunter had a bit of a reputation uh, that somebody to, to be wary of. So he were up on the on the North Ice, and uh, he had been at sea in, a, in this whaling ship for years, and then it became a kind of a leaky old boat, and he thought he would jump the ship and try a different different one. And then uh, he a couple of years later, he, he was up in the North Ice, and he met in with his old crew, and he went along, he thought, oh, I'll go and see what the Shetland boys are saying. And he asked them how they were aboard the old ship, and they said, well, you know, Sean, it's not so good. Yeah, we're were not treated very well and we made the, the silly mistake of uh, bragging about the, our friend who could throw the anvil, the big anvil block and uh, they said no man could ever throw that for a lot of nonsense and we've never lifted it down and then they said to him I don't suppose you could still heave the old anvil block <laughs> well he says the body is still in, still in good shape I don't see why I couldn't Perhaps I should come aboard ship and uh, and have a word with your crew and the captain. So he was relishing this, the idea of going back aboard this old ship. And uh, they gathered everyone on the deck. Shetland men got the men for forward and they got the mate and the bosun and, and the captain up on the, on the deck. And uh, John Hunter, he just said, Well, I've heard that... Uh, the treatment of the Shetland men aboard here has not been so good. And at that he walked over to where this huge ship's anvil was. And it sat on a, on a big uh, metal block as well. There's uh, hundred and hundred weights. And he just threw the anvil away. Just swiped it through it away. And then he gathered up the, the big anvil block and he heaved it down the deck. And it just took great chunks out the deck. And uh, it rumbled on down and he strode down the deck and he got spat in his hands and then he gripped it up again and he heaved it back down and this time it hit into some of this kind of balustrades lying there and took a couple of them out 
And that the captain was just hands in his air and he says, Stop breaking up my ship. <laughs> and John Hunter says, Well, he said, If the th- things don't change around here, he says, I'll come back aboard and I'll tear the yards down about your heads. And uh, if things don't improve, I'll be back aboard. And at, at that, uh, I think that this uh, this fellow's old shipmates had no more bother. Just the thought of Hunter coming aboard. But there's there's one, well, there's several stories about Strong Johnny Hunter. But probably the most famous one is how he saved uh, his fellow crewmates from a polar bear. And uh, this polar bear had been spotted on the ice uh, about three miles away. So they launched the small boat. There were seven, um, seven men in the boat and they rode for this ice floe. And uh, as they approached it, they realised this bear was just uh, quite starving and it was, it was fearful of them approaching and it was also extremely hungry. So it just dived in and started swimming at full speed for the small rowing boat. And uh, with that, the men panicked and uh, one gripped for the the big kind of flensing knife uh, harpoon. And uh, as the bear came up over the side of the boat with his claws, he went for the mouth and the bear just bent it like that, useless. And John Hunter was angry, he was roaring to tell him to go for another part of the bear that would immobilise it. But no, the men did the same thing and all three, um, all three harpoons that they had there were for no use. So that, at this stage, the bear was, bear was fearful and the men, men were roaring and screaming and they, as they ran to the stern of the boat, the bear was coming in over the bow, over the, over the quarter. And uh, John Hunter said, well, this is going to be the end of us all if we don't act fast. So at this stage, he was a, he said, I, I was a young man, 23 in my full strength. And I gripped up the ship's axe and with a mighty blow of all my strength, I took it down on the bear's skull and it went, drove right through to its tongue and he lay dead on the gunnel. And literally that quick action, he, he saved the men and the crew. Uh, he wouldn't last long in those Arctic waters if you ended up in the in the sea. And a couple of other boats had seen what was going on and by the time they arrived then it was all over. And they towed this bear back to the ship with the axe still in. He couldn't get the axe back out. And when they got aboard ship, uh, the captain commended him for his efforts in saving the crew and he got a bottle of whiskey. That was his reward which he shared with the men. He thought they were... Oh, they deserved it probably as much, uh, having gone through the the shock, the shock of that. But the bear, apparently, the bear skull that was taken back, the polar bear, to somewhere in London, and uh, it apparently was in some place where they they stored things like that or a collection, collection there. I've tried to find it, but uh, I've written to various people that never come across it yet. But that was back in eighteen fifteen. Uh, strong Johnny Hunter was on a, a boat from Hull called the Harmony. Harmony of Hull and the, the Captain McBride, I think his name was. So that is, that gives you the date. So anybody that's into that and knows of the log books from the, the Harmony, they went on to actually have quite a good whaling season. And uh, he, he thought the, a lot of that ship. We're going to play a, a really lovely tune from the there's a, a great atmosphere with it. Uh, it's called the Greenland Man's Tune, and this again is from this is from Fettler, from the island of Fettler, where Strong Johnny Hunter came from, and uh, yeah, it, it, we'll we'll say no more and play you the melody.
we played the, the couple of Greenland reels there to start with, um, the Merry Boys of Greenland and Oliver Chack. Well, there, there's a couple of other really good Greenland tunes they're going to play. And the first one is called Willafjord, and that's probably one of the best known Shetland tunes. It was taken back from the whaling days, and uh, there's a couple of versions we play, and then I suppose we end up putting your own own version to things anyway. But uh, it's based on a version by the late Bobby Peterson, who learnt it from his father, who was at the Greenland whaling. And then there's another version where the more syncopated kind of bowing in it, and that's how Tom Tom Anderson played the tune. So we'll we'll play a version of that. But what was interesting, I did a lot of research into this tune and trying to find the actual place where is Willafjord, and uh, I took a lot of reading through the the old um, accounts of folks sailing up to West Greenland, and uh, to track it down. And it's actually the area where the most northerly ice-free port is. So for the Greenland whalers, they probably would have sailed up there and would have been one of the first ports of call. And at that time, it was quite a small village, but uh, a very lively place to arrive into after you've had a, a long sea voyage. And it seemed to be that the time of year when they arrived, the locals were expecting them and they were looking forward to it. And there was one account where they came along, the ice was still quite a lot of ice around, and they actually tied the ship up alongside a big ice floe. And with that, the locals came out with um, dog sleds, and they had uh, goods, they exchanged goods, and uh, they knew, the the captain knew the, a lot of the people and a lot of the crew knew each other. I mean, some of those Shetland men, they never saw a Shetland summer, they spent nearly up to 50 years uh, uh, going out to the Arctic every year so they would, uh, they had a lot of friends and uh, they said you would clean clear away between decks and the fiddles would get going and some of the locals would have fiddles as well because they were great players up, up there in Greenland at, at this, this time and uh, they described that the women would dance 10 to 12 hours without fatigue so they were healthy, fit people, and uh, the reels would go all night, just as they would in Shetland. And there's another great account of them going ashore. This was a kind of officer that had written it. So they were kind of observing what the, the, the rough crew and the locals were doing. They kind of observed. But they said about the, the local Danish, I don't know if they call him a commissioner or something, he opened up the ballroom and this turned out to be an old shed uh, that uh, was probably not long since they cleared out all the old blabber casks and uh, with 60 to the 80 people that crammed in there dancing for hours they said that to be honest that the, the, the smell was something else they couldn't stay any longer and the heat and the smell they said in the place and I suppose that man had been at sea a long time as well but how they, they pictured the scene they said there were three fiddlers up at the end of the room including a, a local local Greenland fiddler and they had a flute and a, a drum as well and uh, the women they said they were amazed in the small space how they could seem to weave in and out and they did this dance very intricate and, and fast and good footwork and when you describe that scene it almost sounded like a Shetland reel in Shetland reel then we have uh, usually three couples and then they do a like a figure of eight through so that kind of weaving through and then the second half of the tune is uh, a back step or a step dance or a shuffle step so it, it almost sounded like that and I can I, could, I can imagine that there, there's other descriptions and anecdotes of Shetlanders going ashore and describing having tunes with the, the locals and the folk dancing and they played Shetland music and um, you'll actually find some samples in the Danish archive uh, early 1900s very early recordings and wax cylinder of uh, Greenland fiddlers and the style is it certainly wouldn't be much different from what you'd expect and, and a high standard you'd expect on the, the here at the dance in Shetland or in Scotland so we're going to play Willafjord and uh, I actually have a a short 
a short clip of footage that I'll show you. I, I visited Wollafjord up in Greenland. Uh, now it's known, this is, that was the name the Shetlanders called it, but um, Sissy Meat is the the Greenlandic name. It's the second town and second biggest town in Greenland, West Greenland there. And uh, I'll show you some footage of them dancing. Uh, it's not the Shetland reel the dancing, but the timing they knew immediately. And if by the th third time through the tune, then the dancer was banging out the, the tune and the rhythm with his feet. But uh, we'll, we'll give you a version of it as well. And we're going into one, a wild Greenland tune called the Yaki Drogan on the back of it. to go closer to home, back to the Shetland Islands and uh, back to the days of the half fishing. So I mentioned earlier the skills the Shetland men had when they, that took them to the north, the skills we handling the small boats, that really came from the local fishing, called, well they call it the half fishing, which means the deep sea fishing. And uh, you'll see today from the remains of the old fishing stations, 
located right on the extreme points of Shetland, so right up in the north mainland there's Featherland and then if you go around to, in North Maven there there's Stennis and Ronersfoe, there were fishing stations and there were smaller stations in, uh, located around there and then in the North Isles as well and in Gloop and the Wasting and Unst and around the coast of Unst you'd find it you'd find the uh, fishing stations and Fettler as well and uh, in fact all, all around there were, I think there was probably I think there were several hundred uh, probably up to 800 boats small boats at one time maybe more yeah. but uh, for an example in Featherland I think there were about 60 boats based there at the peak of that fishing station and there were small wooden boats uh, the earlier ones were about kind of 19 foot, 18 foot a keel, 19 foot, but later in the 19th century they were made slightly bigger, up to about 21 foot of keel, the 30 feet overall, but they were open boats and uh, they were built, they were seaworthy boats, but they were still open boats and they were fishing in uh, pretty uh, extreme ocean, ocean waters out in the Atlantic and the North Sea. So the boats were designed so they could be light enough to be hauled up a beach and uh, they were launched for there and then in, and they would be anchored off in the fine weather in the summer. It was very much a summer fishery and uh, from June through to August. So quite a, a short season for going to the deep sea because uh, then you started to get into the, the threat of storms and, and gales at each side of the season. But it, it, there was a lot of a lot of people involved during that. So you maybe have um, there's six crew in a boat, six arenes, they were called, so six oared boats. Sometimes they might be seven if they had a, a maybe a young uh, another young boy aboard or something. But uh, then on shore they would be drying the fish on the beaches. So there would be people in, involved with that land usually the young young boys or older older men that were retired from the sea and they would man the beaches and that that involved laying out the fish to dry and then stacking them up and protecting them from the weather and uh, that was usually a two day trip that they went off in these open boats so you're talking a, as you said 30 foot overall and with a sail a single sail which is uh, about 240 square feet to sail and they could sail, for, they would row them, and if it was calm weather, obviously they would row, and they might, they might row 10 hours, maybe 13 hours, for the really long trips. And they tended to, they, there are accounts of them going as far as 40 miles, but I think more commonly they were probably half that distance, maybe 20 mile off, but they would go to the deep grounds if the weather seemed to be a, a good spell and the fish was good they would they would chance it and that's out to the edge of the continental shelf and they were working with a long line fishing system so they would have uh, many many hooks i think they were about four fathoms apart and you would get about 1200 hooks so it's miles of fishing line and they would put a buoy and then a line and then a buoy and they would maybe have uh, six six uh, lines they called them parkies or lines and uh, so that that was the the fishing method, and they were fishing for ling and that type of fish that were good for drying on the beach. I'm going to tell you a, a story about uh, the half fishing, and a boat called the Spray, and she was caught in the storm of 1881, which is a it's a famous storm. Is there was a, it was a big fishing disaster in Shetland where fifty eight men were lost that night from ten boats. But the spray was setting off from Fettler. Among there were five boats from Fettler off that night, and the, this boat was skippered by a man called Thomas Tate, and he had built the boat and it was one of his finest sixerines, and uh, she was actually twenty one foot six a keel, so she was a big quite a big sixerine. And she handled extremely well. And in the crew, there were two fiddle players, uh, a man called David Hart, and he was the towsman. And uh, that's 
for hauling the he hauled in the halyards, the tows as we call them, and hoisting the sail and lowering the sail, and that's very important when you're in heavy weather. The skipper and the towsman, they rarely had to speak to each other. They were almost telepathic. They knew the the conditions, and one didn't have to worry about the other. And extremely important. It, the tows was really controlling the power on the on the boat, lowering the sail. And then you had Jacob Gester. He was the oldest man in the crew, 75 years old, and a great fiddle player from Fettler. And his tune, Gester's Dream, is extremely well-known tune and played today. And he taught a lot of folk in Fettler the fiddle as well. And then there was Arthur Tullock as well in the boat. And there was two more boys in the, in the, in the boat, Hart, Hart men, um, that were crew. So there was there were six in the boat and they set off to the fishing. They were going to the deep deep sea grounds, the Fram half and from Eighth and Fettler where they set off it was a good 13 hour row. So that's a long way and uh, it was calm weather, good weather for, for heading off or they wouldn't have been trying the deep sea unless it was good conditions. And that's about 45 miles, I think, to, to get out to the grounds there. So, And by the time you're out there, if you're looking back at Unst, the most northerly island in Shetland, there's a high hill there. It's actually about 935 feet, I think, uh, Saxevoir. And by the time you're away out where the fishing grounds were then, Saxevoir was just on the horizon. Uh, you could see the top of it. So we were a long way off the sea. And they set the lines, they'd, they'd set their lines out there and it was uh, good conditions when, when they set them. And uh, about five o'clock, suddenly the crew noticed the, the sky in the north and the northwest was black. The clouds were so heavy and black and they knew that there was bad weather approaching. Uh, you could tell in, in the boat, everybody was thinking, well, what are they going to be faced with here? And the, the weather hit so fast, the men said they literally had to grab the sou'wester and tie the string under their chin and haul it down. It just hit the boat and the spray was coming up. Just the, uh, the, the weather changed so fast. And one of the men said... Uh, I would see, you would hate to see to the lines. And the skipper says, yes, the lines. He says, without the lines in the boat, we'll not be able to take any sail. She'll not be able to sail without the weight of the lines in the boat. And, the, and these uh, boats could sail well, but they needed ballast to board. And the fish in the lines was that ballast. So they set to to haul the lines. And that's a long, tough job. And as the conditions changed so fast, they were... They put four men on the oars, pointed their up in, head into the wind and haul up and the up to the where the bow was and start hauling. Two men forward, the strongest men hauling. And they put up the the young guys up there to haul this. And uh, they were having a tough job because though they were rowing okay but the sea was that choppy and then they would have to ease off line and then wait for the b big waves to pass and then haul again it took f about four hours of doing this and, and horrendous conditions to get enough lines aboard that the skipper eventually said with the fish we've got and the lines she'll tack the sail now they, they had to set the sail the, while they, they were finishing stowing the lines away the other men tied the reefs in the sail and in the six marine sail, there's, I think in that particular sail, there was four, four reef points that they set, and then they, they can take the peak down, so it's just a, a small narrow sail, and uh, they were about, they got that all tied, and the skipper said, right, we'll put sail on her, and as they did, and she started to take, he says, no, down with the sail, he noticed one of the reefs was tied, was it was uneven tied the tightness on the reefs and he says this is all we've got if we lose if this comes loose or we get a bow in the sail it could rip or tear then that's the end of us so he insisted they re-tied all the reefs 
And in the meantime, they had to dodge in the, in the sea. So they got, got the reefs tied again and put the sail on again. And this time he immediately had to point her up and take two huge seas with the boat. And then he got the skippers aware that they might start to come through the wind. And he told the men, ship, ship an oar up on the forehead taft and uh, stop her for bringing the head around. As soon as the oar went out, it snapped off at the cape, snapped off with a wave, hit it. And he says, out with another oar, he says, where we're going and sailing the night, the oars will be no use to us. So they shipped another oar and they managed to set her on the, on the sail, on the go. But even with the bare mast, with the wind behind them, they were, it was actually foaming at the bow. She was actually going. We just, the, the strength of the wind was enough on the mast to push them forward. So they set sail and the skipper had to run with the, where he could with the following sea. And this is where the towsman really comes into his own as well. Because as they come up on the wave, he'll take the power off and then he'll have to put the power back on again. And, and hoist the sail up again and in those conditions none of us today really have experience of uh, how those boats handled in those conditions it's never been tried for over a hundred years but uh, they were extremely skilled men at handling those small boats out in the ocean now the skipper and the they put in some shift uh, this is hours later the dawn is arising a grey dawn and this is in July. Now it doesn't get that dark in Shetland. It's a fairly short evening spell with the heavy clouds and the and the weather and the visibility, the sky was just black. And then there was a glimmer of light at dawn, a grey, as he said, a grey dawn. And uh, Thomas Tate says, if we see land, it should be Skerries, which is the island group south of Fettler. He says, if we see land, and they did, they spotted land. But they come into some bad tides and really rough waters out by there. And they took, the, the boat went over what he described as three of the largest lumps of sea that, that he was ever seen in his life. And uh, quite understated, this fisherman, the, the towsman says, ah, she, com she was complained surely at that last thing. And... Tommy Tate, the skipper, says, well, she'll just have to complain to get us through this. <laughs> and uh, one of the young boys, the youngest boy, and uh, he turned to old Jacob and, and said that he was frightened. When after that wave, he said, I'm, I'm frightened. And uh, the guesser says, oh, he says, boy, boy, he says, you can feel frightened, but don't say it. He says, that's, all, that's not the way you, he says, you can feel it, but you don't talk about it. And uh, they got through that, those lumps of sea, but it's still uh, the course they were heading and the direction the wind come the northwest. They were running with as many seas as they could, but they also wanted to head in for land. And Thomas says, we're going to have to risk some of these waves or I can't keep a course, we'll miss Shetland entirely. I keep going on this heading and paying off and, and having to go with the, with the seas. So they, they took some hefty lumps. The boat made reasonably dry, but there was one big wave that nearly smothered them, but they sailed right through it. And it just shows what those boats could handle. And eventually the the sea started to smoothen as they came in nearer Shetland. And the uh, the skipper said he could tack the sheet on her again and get the sailing properly. And she said she just took off like a white ma. And uh, she just set off when he could actually sail her. Right. And eventually they got down to land. It turned out to be Bressa. And if you look on the map of Shetland, we've launched Fettler, Scary Swalls, and Bressa. So they were, that's about 30 miles south of Fettler. But a very long way, they would have been 13 hours on at sea sailing and uh, in these conditions. And they made a sheltered vo in the north of Brescia called Aethvo. 
And there's a couple of versions of this. I heard from my neighbour, George Emerson, whose grandfather was in, in the boat that they came through Brasserswind and then went into Aceful. And another one, they just went to Aceful and the, they said that the crew would wanted to go ashore in Larwick, but the skipper wouldn't have let them. He was feared they might take drink and they were so weak. And it, being exposed in that weather out there and the cold and hungry and weak, uh, that he was feared that there might just be the end of some of them. And there's another story, they were in the other version, is in the, they were in Aethro and a boat came off and offered them spirits, but they declined. Um, but uh, they had no, the peat was all wet in the boat, they couldn't make a fire for a kettle or anything like that. So the skipper said, we'll just dinner roar right up the vow, boys. We'll just go and rest here. A start. And then the towsman, David Hart, says, says, Tommy, says, God has given thee this land. Why does thou not attack it? And um, the skipper says, Well, the same God the Scott was here. He says, He'll get us home safely. And it wasn't long before they set sail for Fettler again. And they still had four reefs in the sail, very pretty sail. And they bit up heading for Fettler and by the time they got to the north end of the island of Falsa then they slipped out two reefs they were doing the two reefs and when they came to Fettler they were on their full sail and they came in by there's a headland there really prominent high cliffs called Lamaca and there were people out there looking they were looking for the boats and uh, they they spied the spray. She was the last one to, to come home. And she was a white, the only one that was painted. So the most of them were kind of tarred or had that Stockholm tar on her. And uh, she was white painted with dark top three boards. And they sailed in by the headland. Ah, the folk were waving for the banks. And and one of the men kind of laughed. He said, oh, see that? That thing's laughing and waving. And he said, oh, and the skipper says, well, I'm blind they can do that, I, there was, we might easier no been here for them to wave at. And they then came into the beach of aid, and by that time, the sail was lying, hanging on the mast, just flat on the mast, and uh, they had to row the last piece in on the beach. And the skipper, when he took off his left mitten, where he'd been holding the sheet, he took off then the flesh, the skin came away. It'd been 13 hours holding that sheet and they made it ashore. So that was that was the spray. She made it home. It was a, an epic uh, test of the crew and the skipper and the boat to make it through those conditions. And uh, the skipper, they said the boat never went to the fishing again after that. It really was absolutely done. And she had been twisted and stressed so much. But she was used as a, a boat for flitting peats, fuel and, and that for a few years. And the mast, they said that for the raki that uh, goes around ties, holds the yard on, rubbing up and down, there was just grooves in the mast where she had been, this pressure on and the, after that night, uh, that, that trip. So the spray, she ended up once... Uh, she, she lay there in, in Fettler. Once uh, Thomas Tate had passed away then, his family had the bo old boat as a, a lammy house at North Dedal. So the crew of the boat, to go back to, to those fiddle players, then we're going to play the tune that the Towsman was well known for called Hyogra Vilta. That was named after his, his nickname was Hyogra Vilta from the croft he lived on. So we're going to play that. And my neighbour in Fettler... Uh, when I'm up there, uh, Joe Jimison, and actually his grandfather was in the in the boat, the spray that night, as a young young man. So and Joe is a fiddle player, and I actually learnt the tune from him, and he he's kept the tune going in Fettler. Uh, Joe will be, be approaching ninety now, I think. But uh, yeah, great fiddle player. So we're going to play this this one, Hyogravolta.
Joe Gravelta. Now I, th I think we'll finish up this half fishing section. There's so many great stories about the half fishing and uh, you can, uh, there's a few good books on the half fishing that are worth a, a read and uh, referencing it with lots of other, other stories and I'll, I'll maybe see if I can post somewhere reference to where you can look them up and also in the Greenland Whaling Days there's a great book on that, Shetlanders and the Greenland Whaling published by the Shetland Times and I actually have a book myself um, called In Search of Willowfjord so uh, I'll post about that, you can you can look that up if you're interested and you'll find some there's some great photos in there and old archive ones of the Green, Greenlanders playing the fiddle and and the photos of the area so uh, I'll post some information on that so we're going to finish up with, this is a fine tune from Gester, Jacob Gester the, the oldest man in, in the boat and he was a, quite a character and uh, he taught the fiddle to, he had a young neighbour, Thomas Hunter and uh, Thomas would come along and help him with the corn and thresh the corn and the deal was that once they were, he was thrashed the tray of corn, then old Gester would teach him a new tune. So that's how, how he passed on the tunes. And the Gester's dream, he was surely coming him for a wedding some night uh, way late on, and he set him doing a hint of stone for a rest, and uh, he heard this music, or it came to him, whether it was from the trous, or it got the name Jacob's Dream, or Gester's Dream. And uh, then we're going into a tune that I composed, and I thought, well, the Towsman has a tune, and Gester has a tune, tune so this one's for the skipper, and it's a, a, another jig as well. Last few seasons, uh, uh, last few summer seasons, we've been lucky to be a volunteer crew on a sixerine in Lerwick here. The Shetland Museum has a replica sixerine and it's traditionally rigged and there's some really great skippers, experienced skippers that take it off and take crew and train them up, folk like myself. And uh, we've had some great trips off and learn how to sail sail the boat and see how she handles and we'll try the sail in different uh, conditions we'll get maybe we've tried her with two reefs and three reefs and had some great fun going off and uh, I'm going to leave you with some footage of the, the boat sailing we have two replica sixerines in Shetland there's one in Unst called the Far Half and last last year at the Shetland Boat Week 
we got the two boats on the water sailing together and that was said they thought about the first time in about a hundred years there's been two traditionally rigged six serines sailing together so it's a it's a great thing to have and I've, we've learned so much in doing it and learning how these vessels sailed and, and handled and hopefully eventually they'll, they'll be able to hand on some of the sailing skills as well some of our, our skippers so uh, it's a there's a few tunes already been inspired by this uh, experience as well so we'll, we'll leave you with a good going go and set uh, to accompany some uh, great sailing footage of the Vela May. I'd like to thank the Scottish International Storytelling Festival for asking myself and Ewan to come along and play some tunes and tell some yarns and hopefully sometime we'll actually make it down to Edinburgh and visit the event or maybe meet some of you storytelling folk up in Shetland. So we'll leave you with these tunes. Thank you. Thank you.